we move forward with the next presentation. It will be given uh, by Moritz Bayer from HHI in Berlin, and his talk will be on Indium Forms Find Peaks for Sensing. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, hello. Uh, also, from my side, uh, thank you very much, Pascual, for inviting me here to give this talk. Um, yeah, my name is Moritz Bayer. I'm uh, leading the newly formed uh, group uh, Photonic Indium Phosphide Foundry at Fraunhofer HHI. So most people of you, uh, pro everybody probably knows about the Fraunhofer Society. So Fraunhofer HHI, for those of you who don't, do not know, is um, a research institute in Berlin, Germany, uh, which um, has its own indium phosphide processing line. And um, do is, that does well, classically um, mostly telecom uh, devices and telecom photonic components. Um, but as the title of this talk suggests, we are diversifying. So just a quick outline of the talk. Um, move over here. Um, so I want to stress that integrated photonics uh, does not equal silicon photonics. I think here in this audience, this point is clearly made already. But uh, this is a rather generic slide deck. And for many people, this, this is actually not, not totally obvious. Um, I will go through our act, uh, technology that we have in, in quite some detail, I suppose, because we are not a company. We are a research institute, after all, um, even though very, very much industry focused. Um, give examples of the capabilities and the building blocks that you uh, get from this technology and then uh, f some photonic integrated circuits that actually have been uh, manufactured um, in our foundry specifically for sensing applications and then there's going to be a QA I hope. <coughs> um, okay, so why, why indium phosphide and, and what uh, for those of you who are not aware, this, this is basically what we call the world map of semiconductors, right? So um, why would anybody care about this weird 3-5 semiconductor indium phosphide? Um, well, first and foremost, it's really not about indium phosphide. It's about, so you, you use it as a substrate, but you don't really care about indium phosphide at all. What you care about is that you can let us match grow all sorts of quaternary materials, indium gallium arsenide phosphide on top of indium phosphide, let us match, so it's, it's, it works out quite nicely architecturally. And the resulting band gaps you can achieve uh, cover the whole glass fiber transmission window, so you can get band gaps in the O and C band. And this, this is really um, what, what makes indium phosphide so attractive. Plus the fact that uh, the line here is actually green as opposed to red, like silicon, for instance, over here. Green in this plot means it's a direct band gap. You do not have to violate momentum conservation to get photons out of your chip. So that really helps making lasers. Um, OK, so the idea, wh uh, what we do, um, we, we, we do multi-project wafer runs. Uh, not only, but, but we certainly do offer those uh, very much uh, in the spirit of what Moses was pioneering already back in the 80s, or even before that. Um, in silicon, uh, we do offer indium phosphide uh, photonic MPW runs, uh, commercially since 2016, and <coughs> in R&D projects already before that. Um, okay, so uh, on the technology, well, what do you actually really need to, to, to have um, in an indium phosphide technology to, to make, to enable photonic integrated circuits with a wide variety of, of functionalities? Well, um, basically you can, you can put this in perspective if you think about photon energy. So if, uh, for a given photon energy, if you want to have low loss waveguides, if you want to have gain, and if you want to have detection that dictates to you, okay, you need to have different band gaps monolithically integrated on one chip. So for lawless waveguides, obviously band gap has to be much greater than the photon energy, so you don't get any uh, absorption. The gain should be pretty much centered around your photon energy, and detection um, is, is enabled by having band gaps which are smaller than the photon energy. So we wanted to have a platform that works in the C-band, so you just plug in the numbers. Uh, we typically give band gaps not in terms of uh, electron volts, but in nanometers of uh, photoluminescence, just for convenience. Um, so those really are the, uh, the, the band gaps um, that we need to integrate in order to achieve all those functionalities, right? Um, so that, that basically poses the technological uh, challenge that you have to solve if, if you want to develop uh, uh, integration technology in indium phosphide. 
And um, how we tackle this problem is basically using a combination of two well-known uh, and established techniques. The first one is uh, vertical evanescent coupling and uh, selective regrowth. So we, uh, we do not go the one-chip approach. Uh, we actually do have regrowth steps in our, in our technology. Um, so putting it all together, how the cross-section looks like, I will go through it step by step, uh, is, is uh, like this. So um, we have quantum wells giving you gain. Um, they are sandwiched in a pin uh, sort of structure, so you can pump them. Um, and they are butt coupled. Uh, here, here uh, the uh, regrowth step happens somewhere in during the processing to a passive waveguide core. And on top of the passive waveguide core, we have uh, uh, ternary uh, layers, which give you uh, absorption. Um, and so if, 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 this, if this layer here is on top of the waveguide, light propagates happily along the waveguide, it's going to see a huge index uh, on top here. So it, it evanescently couples upwards. Um, so this gives you basically the, the third row here in this table detection. Um, <coughs> And so putting it all together, how the process uh, looks like is we start with the base wafer, which is basically just a purely active quantum well base, base epi. Uh, we pattern the quantum wells to get gain wherever it needs to be, uh, edge them away uh, anywhere else. Um, regrow uh, peak cladding. Um, we need to regrow the peak cladding because we want to uh, be able to have uh, gratings. Um, then we etch uh, all, all, uh, all the material away where there's supposed to be passive waveguides and or uh, photodetectors eventually. Uh, we regrow um, this passive waveguide plus photodetector layer um, that I mentioned previously. And then we do patterning of the waveguides of the, of the photodetector MISAs um, and, and everything else and some metallization steps, of course. Um, <coughs> So the, 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 the top view, how, how all of this looks like from a customer perspective, basically, is, is like this. So uh, once, once you register for a given tape out date, um, you submit a design, uh, you will most likely get some feedback from us unless you are very experienced um, on, on what things you might want to correct. Um, you incorporate this. Um, then we assemble mask reticles. Uh, also in-house, we have our own tools to, to make our own mask sets. Um, we uh, carry out the wafer fabrication. So this is basically in, uh, what in Peter's slides uh, was, I think, the 90 days for the, for the long process. Um, this happens in here. And as, as he mentioned, also in our case, I mean, even though this is actually pretty much same, the same figure, 90 days roughly, but there's a couple of steps before and afterwards. So from a customer perspective, it's much longer. Or not much, but it's, it's certainly longer than, than just the processing time. Because after, after uh, pure wafer fabrication and fab time, there's still going to be some backend processing, cleaving, coating. So we do, um, well, obviously, we do we the edge cup coupling, and so all our facets are anti-reflection coated. You can have highly reflection coating on request. And uh, we also have to validate the wafers before we do the, sh the shipment. And then finally, we do ship using those nice little orange cars. We actually really do ship via TNT. <clears throat> okay, and so th putting it all together, this, this is what it gives you. Um, so again, this is just the, the, the cross-sectional cartoon view of, of what, what, what's going on in, in the technology. And um, those are really the, the building blocks or an overview of the building blocks that you get from it. So we have all sorts of pa passive functionalities, also including full polarization handling. So it's not something that's reserved for silicon. We also uh, offer both polarization splitters and or combiners, and also polarization rotators. Um, thermo optic uh, machsenders uh, or, or face modulators, uh, we have tunable gratings, uh, SOAs, uh, current injection phase sections, and um, lasers, both DFB and DPR type. Um, since uh, like one year now, we have electroabsorption modulators in there as well. And, uh, photo detectors as well as balanced photo detectors. So I sh should have said that earlier, our substrates are always semi-insulating, um, so you can separate N regions from one another, so you can easily implement balanced detection. Um, and all this comes with, with the commodities like uh, high frequency ground signal ground tracks, and you can route ground, ground signal ground tracks over waveguides. There's predefined building blocks for crossings and, and this kind of stuff. 
Right, so just uh, through a couple of examples of building blocks and how they actually look like and what kind of performance you get out of them. The passive waveguides are around 1 dB per centimeter um, in the low loss case, um, uh, which, is, which is this uh, shallowly etched uh, waveguide, which unfortunately, because the confinement is rather low, uh, you cannot really tightly bend. Um, so for tight bends, you, you typically want to use a deeply etched waveguide where, where the core is completely etched and those you can bend around 150 micrometers. And those are also the ones we use for um, MMI couplers as well as uh, AWGs. Then as I mentioned, we have polarization rotators. We also have splitters, but I don't have a slide on them here. Um, so um, as one of the first uh, integrated polarization rotators, we actually started plotting their performance not just in um, percents or, or dB of polarization extinction ratio, but uh, they, they work so nicely that actually if you if you plot them in terms of rotationary, rotationary angle, um, then um, the figure still does not look too bad. So actually, so this, um, what, what I should say is here between 95 and 85 degrees um, is what you get within the C-band pr uh, pretty much. This is better than 20 dB polarization extinction ratio. So even though, I mean, you might say, okay, it's plus minus five degrees. Well, if you, if you convert this to dB, because um, this, this always refers to fields, um, this is actually quite quite good performance, and it's around one dB or less for both polarizations um, <coughs> of insertion loss, and it's completely passive. Right? Um, we have DFB lasers, and you can actually directly modulate those DFB lasers and, and kick them up to 50 gigabit per second if you use PAM4. Um, they're around uh, 20 gigahertz in, in uh, electro-optic bandwidth, and you can. Um, so they operate even at 50 degrees C uh, or beyond. And um, so uh, the design parameter that the customer gets is basically the wavelength. So you can set them to operate within, uh, for, for any given wavelength within the C-band. The same goes for the DBR lasers. Um, they're complex coupled, I should say. So they are rather insensitive comparatively to, to back reflections as well. <coughs> um, Using the same active layer, uh, we also offer electroabsorption modulators. Um, they, they are also right now, they should be improving pretty soon, around 20 to 25 gigahertz electro-optic bandwidth. Um, and they're, but their ideal operating point, because it's the same active layer as the lasers, is a bit shifted towards longer wavelengths, so you, you really can't use them at the, the blue side of, of the C-band um, for reasonable uh, bias conditions. But in the, depending on the length, this is for a 200 micron long device, you get uh, more than 20 dB of uh, static extinction ratio. Right, and we also offer a compound uh, building block. So one uh, example for those would be a DBR laser. So the actual elementary building blocks we offer are, are things like ratings or gain blocks or phase sections. But for people who don't really get their feet wet with, uh, with laser design and, and the, all, all the physics that's involved there, uh, we, we gi uh, give out some predefined parameters and you, they automatically get basically plugged together in your PDK to form a predefined DBR laser um, using, well, rear reflectors or long grating and short grating and an SOA interface section in between. And by playing with, so those are just linear gratings, no vernier uh, shenanigans or anything like this. And you, so you can tune them by uh, around four nanometers if you, uh, if you work with the phase section and the gratings um, accordingly. Uh, we are working on um, releasing a vernier type uh, C-band tunable lasers uh, this year, but this, this is still work in progress. And can't show any results yet. Right, um, so this is on the technology and its capabilities. Um, so now I will switch gears a little bit and just go uh, rapid fire basically through uh, several examples that, that have been, uh, well, several picks that have been made using this technology. So the first one I want to start with is actually not, was not uh, very far from here. At QSight is a spin-off company from ICFO in Castel de Fels, Barcelona. So that's 150 kilometers from here or something like this. Um, <clears throat> where they, um, it's actually a rather simple circuit, but uh, be, because they, they, so the design was very easy. Um, but even for a simple circuit like this, like if, if there's no open MPW, open access foundry, even doing something like you have two lasers and an MMI and a photo detector, it's not something you can just get for a couple of thousand euros from, in, from foundry, right? If they don't offer a multi-project reference. Then that, so how this works is, um, well, you operate, the, the, first of all, the two lasers are detuned in wavelength from one another. The first one is operated CW. The second one is pulsed. 
Now, quantum mechanics dictates that the starting phase of, uh, of any given pulse is not deterministic. It's just whatever phase the laser feels like. And so if you interfere those two because they are uh, detuned, uh, those, two, uh, those two signals, um, you will get a beating signal on your photodetector. And um, this, the phase of this beating signal, again, is determined by the phase, uh, the optical phase of, of uh, any of those pulses. And so by measuring the phase of your beat signal, which you can measure electronically, you actually get a true random, quantum random signal. So they use this for, uh, as a quantum entropy source, um, which really just guaranteed by physics um, has a, well, the autocorrelation function here, I think is below 10 to minus uh, three, uh, um, right, which is apparently exactly what they want. Um, so actually, yeah, I should have saved the slides. I want to cut this one out. Um, another one uh, was uh, mode locked laser, which was uh, designed uh, by Bright Photonics in the Netherlands. Um, the logo, unfortunately, also got lost here for for um, customer in China um, using uh, AWG. So this AWG, as, as some other things uh, in our platform, we do not offer ourselves. So there's third parties, for instance, Bright Photonics, who offer libraries uh, of, of, let's call them third party PDKs, um, where you rely not on our knowledge, but uh, on their knowledge, uh, because they're highly specialized in AWGs um, to, give, uh, to give you a good, well, um, extinction ratio and, and all that of, of the AWG. Um, so um, they actually got um, nine picosecond pulses uh, with a repetition rate of uh, 12 gigahertz, which apparently was exactly what they designed. And they use an, a structure where they, where they load each channel of the AWG with a uh, distinct SOA. So it's not just one gain section, it's a gain section basically in each wavelength channel, giving you those nine picosecond pulses. Um, another application, which unfortunately I can only show those kinds of pictures, but no real chips because it's customer in the US and they're all, always very delicate about those things, was for the LIGO interferometer, um, where we made uh, photo detectors actually for, for, um, for quite exotic wavelength, but you can still squeeze this out of indium phosphide, or into indium phosphide, I should say. Where, um, so for, not for the first generation, but the, the uh, I think two years ago, um, they upgraded their interferometer um, using our photo detectors um, to basically to increase sensitivity. And, and even for those kinds of applications, um, our uh, integrated photo detectors find, find quite, quite a lot of interest in applications. So they're using them right now, actually. Um, <clears throat> the same goes uh, for, for our laser uh, circuits, uh, which actually now are in space, um, so sensing methane. So uh, again, as, as Martijn was indicating, uh, env env environmental policies are, are really uh, building up and people want to look at the at our atmosphere, not just from within the atmosphere, but also from the outside. So this is where satellites come in. And using, using uh, back reflections or sensing back reflections at the right wavelengths, also like, I think those are in the O-band. Um, you, you can actually sense uh, methane concentrations. And so why I bring this example up, it's not the only one, but it's one of them where we launched uh, indium phosphide chips into space. Uh, we actually also went through a couple of qualification stages with a um, couple of other companies. Indium phosphide really is suitable for, for space applications. So it's radiation hard. And um, if you package it right, then you do not really get any problems with, with the implantation from f uh, free ions or whatever. It's lurking around in space. Um, another example which, which I personally found really interesting because I was in contact with the designers quite a lot um, is here from University of Princeton. So this is, this is the overall chip, a uh, four by six millimeter um, all optical neuron is what they call it now. But when they submitted this design, um, I had no idea what it, was, what it was for. And that's actually part of what makes my job really interesting being a foundry guy is I get all those, we get all those chips and designs for all different applications and most of the time we don't even know what they're meant to do and what kind of application the designer has in mind. So we looked at this and we saw, okay, so you know, they have, so what, it, what is going on here? If you zoom in here into this little piece, there's a DFP laser and there's a couple of photo detectors and the, the photocurrent of those photo detectors is 
uh, feeding into the DFP laser. So th th those GSG pads here are the P and N pads of a DFP laser, and those full detectors are just directly uh, shortcut uh, connected to the DFP laser. So, I mean, I thought, okay, this doesn't really make any sense. Are you sure you really want to do this? No, no, don't trust us. We simulated it. Apparently, they really simulated this in, in PicWave and uh, so Photon Design software. And it was doing exactly what they wanted to do, but of course, they couldn't share the res results of this. It's just like, okay, this is exactly what we want. Okay, we fabricated the chip, and um, they got some really nice papers out of this. So apparently, um, this is um, so what, how it works is you launch an optical signal, in, a pulsed optical signal into your photo detectors. You electrically, electrically bias the laser just below threshold. So whenever a pulse comes into, into one of those photo detectors, it might, it might just trip the laser over the edge, right, over threshold. But um, because the laser is also sort of a capacitor, it integrates. So if it's just one pulse, it's not enough. Um, as you can see, this is the laser output. You, you are still below threshold. But if you have three pulses in short repetition, then all of a sudden you get a huge spike in laser power. Uh, so this is a very nonlinear non behavior, and this is exactly what neurons are all about, right? Um, as I just learned reading this paper. But that's one of those examples where, like from a foundry perspective, wait, this doesn't make any sense. No, it really does. And apparently, so this is exactly the kind of behavior they expected, including the time constants and so on. So you learn a lot, lot about your own technology, actually. <coughs> um, right, another one uh, also here, now I have the logo included, uh, AWGs from, from Bright Photonics um, was a 100 channel uh, WDM receiver. So this uses a clever configuration of two different kinds of, um, of AWGs. The original purpose was for fiber break sensor readouts um, to, to give you basically 100 photo detectors. So th those are the pads of 100 uh, different photo detectors, which are integrated on this, uh, I think it was 7 by 6 millimeters uh, chip. Um, and so this is the this is basically the plot you get out of it. Uh, the, the the optical frequency response I shouldn't say a frequency response wavelength response. Each curve here is uh, one individual uh, photo detector spectrum. So uh, the response you get from them, they are exactly spaced by one nanometer across 100 nanometers, so 100 channels. And um, I I made a plot once just to make it even more messy where I overlaid the simulations from the designer on top of those experimental results and it was exactly the same. So the dashed lines really actually did coincide with, with, with the solid lines but then you can't really see anything anymore so I left it out. Um, including, including things like those dips. So those periodic dips every 10 nanometers come from the fact you use a cyclic AWG uh, together with a non-cyclic AWG to give you this cascaded sort of design. Um, and so, because those questions come up all the time, I like to use this example about yield, right? What is our yield? So those were 100 photo detectors. We measured uh, just the first chip that we got out of FAB. Um, all, all the photo detectors worked, so there's really nothing hidden in here. And uh, the dark currents of all the photo detectors were, were below 10 nanograms. So uh, can make of that. <clears throat> um, rather new example is this one. Um, well, so you can dub it either a Stokes vector receiver if you talk to telecom people. Uh, now I'm supposed to talk about sensing, so I just call it a fully integrated polarimeter. It's really the same thing. It's just a very fast polarimeter. Um, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first integrated polarimeter uh, in indium phosphide at least. I'm also not aware of other integration technologies, but I might be wrong there. Um, it's basically a five-way Marzener structure. Um, and how this chip works is um, so terminated with five photo detectors. You launch a couple of uh, known polarizations into the chip, do some linear algebra to, to calibrate your chip. Once you have the calibration, um, you, you just save it in, in some file. And afterwards, you can launch. So this is a Poincaré sphere. Any dot here corresponds to any state of polarization. Um, you launch. Um, so the, the, the blue circles here are the states of polarization we launched into the chip. And the red dots are basically the answers that our chip gave us. So the red dots are within the blue circles, works quite nicely. Actually, uh, with below one degree, so better than one degree accuracy over the whole C-band and even beyond. So it's a rather nice 
polarimeter. And because those are high frequency photo detectors, you can really um, measure at uh, 40 gigahertz electro optic or 45 gigahertz electro optic bandwidth. Um, I also wanted to uh, cut out this one. Um, so that's another uh, fiber break uh, interrogator from Fast Technology in Ireland, actually, um, which they fabricated in one of our MPWs, um, where they basically made a case study just showing how much of an advantage of photonic integration technology can be um, sometimes. Just, so this is the system they, they, they commercially use uh, and sell. And so, of course, the footprint really goes down, but, but what you can basically can take away from, from this plot using this photonic integrated circuit in this box, just due to mechanical and thermal reasons, the stability is much, much higher. Um, so you have, if you're dealing with noisy signals, photon photonic integration can really um, be a great leverage. So I guess since I'm running out of time, um, I should really only cover maybe that last example, which is, um, uh, we heard a couple of things about LiDAR already. Um, we have a research group at our institute which is dealing with terahertz spectroscopy. Um, and so what they want to do, um, this is still only a sketch that's in fab right now, is um, basically the analog to LiDAR or radar but with, uh, for terahertz. So what they have here is they, they have two detuned uh, DBR lasers. Um, again, detuned in wavelength. They uh, in, let them interfere in, a, in an MMI, uh, so you get a terahertz beating signal, which optically is not too difficult to achieve. It's just four to eight nanometers of detuning. And uh, you have a couple of bow ties uh, antennas, and so you get, if you include phase sections, uh, uh, um, a lobe of terahertz radiation, uh, which, you can, which you can steer, ideally, in, um, in two spatial directions. Right. Um, so, how this is it on the uh, on, on the on the pick examples um, putting it all together. This is basically the, how it looks like from a designer point of view, right? I mean, so you can you, you can choose any of those uh, companies basically to be supported via uh, with the PDK. Uh, here, for instance, in Lumerical, this is how it looks like right now. Um, this list of companies is actually growing um, more and more. Um, can really in, 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 in commercial software tools now uh, use like drag and drop to um, either simulate your devices, but also then after you did your simulation, uh, we, we start using co-integration with layout tools to just um, give you the, the layout of, of your chip, um, basically by, the ver by virtue of clicking a button after you, you're f uh, happy with your, with your simulations. Um, Right, I went through this already, so uh, let me conclude uh, basically with, with, with this last slide here, giving you an idea of, of, of the costs involved, um, at least in the MPW case, and if uh, maybe some, some people um, actually want to go one step further for dedicated runs, uh, we are always open for, for any proposals from people uh, who are not happy with the exact performances or with the exact wavelengths or whatever we offer in M MPW, then we are always open for dedicated runs. So here's my phone number, you can contact me anytime. Thank you very much. A question from the audience to the speaker. Are there any questions? Okay. So your uh, question about the terahertz chip is that uh, also with uh, MPW compatible technology or? Yes. <clears throat> is that actually an MPW? That's on one of our MPWs right now, actually, yeah. So how are the antennas then uh, realized? And what kind of? Well, let's just, uh, so we, we, we abuse the uh, metallization tracks, which you normally use for routing of signals to make an antenna out of it. And the, and the semiconductor by itself is good enough for this particular performance. Yeah, for antennas. It's not a photo detector, right? Or is it? No, what the, so there's, oh yeah, um, there's photo detectors right at the end of a waveguide. Oh, there are photo detectors. It's not these uh, photoconductive antennas. 
No, it's not for the no, no. So we don't have photoconductors in our MPWs. If that's your question, we don't. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is a photo detector uh, coupled yes. to an antenna, and uh, then so the receiver up to would be a non-trivial task, right? This is only a terahertz transmitter. If you want to make a terahertz receiver, you need photoconductors, and then we are out basically. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Uh, sorry, Martin. <laughs> Sorry, there is one, one question. About, um, about the um, random uh, generator, the yeah. random, uh, what type of um, lasers are you using, uh, the type of the pulse lasers? So those were the TFP lasers. Um, where are they? Here. The pulsed ones. Well, those are literally the same, la the same device, the same laser, just the grating period is slightly different. But it's both, they are both DFP lasers. So Q switching, you know, of one of the DFP lasers gives you. Okay, one switch. of them is Q switched, is that correct? Which is just a fancy way of turning it on and off electrically, right? Just okay, yeah. thank you. So thank you, uh, Maurice, for your presentation. We will proceed with the next speaker. Thank you.